Do you have any scars? You got any scars? I, I have this scar on my neck, and so when it's summer, like when I'm wearing a t-shirt or beach weather or something, people always ask me, what, what happened on your neck there? And I say, you know, when I was in high school, I was really running with some people in the wrong crowd, and one day we got in some trouble because of some stuff we did, and these people were chasing us, and then they actually took some shots at us, and one of them grazed my neck. Why is that funny? Who's laughing at me? <laughs> And they say, really? And I said, no, actually, I had a mole removed, but that sounds a lot better. Um, and, you know, I, I have another scar on my knee, and I'm not going to show it to you, but uh, it's from basketball. And, you know, you say that, like, got a scar playing basketball. That sounds kind of cool. But then when I tell you more details, it's not really that cool because I was at basketball practice. It wasn't even a game. And me and some guys were playing 21 before uh, before practice started, and I was going for a loose ball, and another guy just shoved me from behind and shoved me right into the ball cart, and the ball cart took a divot out of my knee, so I had to go to the hospital and get some stitches. You know, not a very good scar to have. And the thing is, we love talking about our scars. So here's what I want you to do for a second. I'm just going to take a break for a second. I want you to turn to the person or people around you, and I want you to tell them your scar story. Tell them what scar you have. Tell them how you got it. Brag a little bit. Make it sound a little better than it really was. Please keep it PG. Go. Okay, I'm going to have to cut you off. I see people like walking across the room to tell their scar stories now. You'll have to pick that up after service. Uh, I did see somebody at the 430 service holding up their pinky and pointing at their scar just like that. Now, we all love a good scar story. Now, the truth is some of you have scar stories because you are stupid. I mean, they are stupid scars. You jumped out of the treehouse. That was dumb. You tried to juggle knives. You were an idiot. You thought you could open a bottle with your arm. That was stupid. But this series, what we're talking about is deeper scars, right? The professor says, I'm sorry you didn't qualify. The doctor says it's malignant. You get a pink slip, the company's closed down. Your mate shocks you by saying, I don't love you anymore, I'm out of here. Your mom telephones and with a trembling voice says, honey, dad's gone. Your teenage daughter is raped and is pregnant. The police stop by and say, there's been an accident. We think you have a child involved. I received an email last night from somebody at Mosaic talking about his battle scars. I said, Carl, I've been pondering several different points of self-discovery since we've begun battle scars. I could write about losing my father when I was six, the abuse at the hand of an uncle who was a minister, I could tell you about searching frantically for a father figure, thinking I had one day discovered one in my grandfather. My hopes were dashed a couple of years after he passed away on Father's Day. Ironic. When my brother died from cancer, it was the most painful time of my life. This was a beast I couldn't fight. I couldn't defend him no matter how hard I wanted to, and when he passed, I felt more lost than ever. See, I had been a Christian since I was seven. My mother always told me to address God like I would my earthly father. But I couldn't figure out how a God who was a father to the fatherless would allow this to happen. I was miserable with life. This is the last week of our Battle Scar series. We've been looking at the story of a man named Job in the Bible. We've looked at the different perspectives of everybody in the story. And this week, the last week, we get to the perspective of Job. The question is, how do I respond when I'm the one going through a hard time? I want to show you the three stages Job goes through when he's suffering. I think these may be what you go through as well, and I'm going to show you the answer of how you need to respond when you are suffering. Here are Job's three stages. First, he's naive. Job 1.18 says, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Another messenger had just come and said, all your possessions have been stolen, all your employees are killed. 
This one says, Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed. All your children are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb. I'll be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had. The Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Then Job loses his health. Satan struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. She's saying, Give up. But Job replied, You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. I want you to notice a few things here. What he says is true. He should praise the Lord. He shouldn't only praise God in good times. The truth is, if there is a God who is all everything, we should praise him no matter what. So when I say Job's naive, I don't mean it in a bad sense. It's just he's kind of in the adrenaline rush. Rick Warren's son committed suicide just under a year ago in his first series after taking a couple months off or a few months off of preaching when he came back was called How to Get Through What You're Going Through. He shared, here's the stages of pain that you go through when you suffer. Shock, which is a human emotion. Sorrow, a godly emotion. Struggle, when you ask the why questions. Surrender and service. And Rick Warren said, service is when God takes your greatest pain and turns it into your life message. In the shock stage, one thing I've seen is an adrenaline rush that comes and gets you through that. I think that's what Job has here, but eventually that wears off. I've talked to so many people who've lost a loved one, and that first week, month, season, holiday is kind of easy to get through because of the adrenaline rush. It's after that first season that the dull ache of loss sets in. My dad's dad passed away a couple years ago, and my dad recently told me, you know, Carl, the more time it goes by, the more I miss my dad. It's important when you're in what I'm calling the naive stage or that initial stage that you have something to fall back on. See, Job is grounded in the truth. He doesn't have these bad things happen and then go searching for answers. He's prepared. He's not figuring out, okay, my life stinks. Should I follow God or not? In his book on suffering, Philip Yancey interviewed a friend of his named Douglas who had suffered. First, Douglas's wife was diagnosed with cancer, and the treatments really debilitated her. She lost her hair. She struggled with very severe depression. While that was going on, one day their family was struck by a drunk driver, and Douglas's daughter escaped with just a broken arm. His daughter escaped with just scratches and bruises, but Douglas took the worst of it. He had significant head trauma that impaired him. Uh, and will impair him for the rest of his life. He lost a sense of balance, so he couldn't uh, get upstairs or downstairs alone. He always needed someone to help him. Sometimes he had mental lapses. He could have debilitating headaches at any moment that would strike him unable to do anything. And worst of all, from his perspective, because he was an avid reader, he could never read more than two uh, pages at a time the rest of his life. So Nancy got together for breakfast with him and recounted his story to make sure he had the details right. In the course of their conversation, he learned that Douglas's wife, just that morning, they had found another spot on her. So Yancey asked him how he handled disappointment with God, and he braced himself for the typical responses of disappointment, bitterness, anger. And here's what Yancey wrote. Douglas was silent for what seemed like a long time. He stroked his peppery gray beard and gazed off. I wondered if he was having a mental gap. Finally, he said, to tell you the truth, Philip, I didn't feel any disappointment with God. I was startled. Douglas, says Yancey, Douglas had always rejected easy formulas like turn your scars into stars. Here's what Douglas went on to say. The reason is this. I learned first through my wife's illness and then especially through the accident not to confuse God with life. 
I'm no stoic. I'm as upset about what happened to me as anyone could be. I feel free to curse the unfairness of life and to vent all my grief and anger, but I believe God feels the same way about that accident, grieved and angry. I don't blame him for what happened. Douglas continued. I've learned to see beyond the physical reality in this world to the spiritual reality. We tend to think life should be fair because God is fair, but God is not life. And if I confused God with the physical reality of life by expecting constant good health, for example, then I set myself up for a crashing disappointment. God's existence, even his love for me, does not depend on my good health. If we develop a relationship with God apart from our life circumstances, then we may be able to hang on when the physical reality breaks down. We can learn to trust God despite all the unfairness of life. Isn't that, after all, really the main point of Job? Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Now Jesus was really wise, but it honestly doesn't take much wisdom to say that. We know that. We get that. So are you grounding yourself now in something that can weather the storm when the storm comes? This is why you read your Bible every day. This is why you pray every day. This is why you're at Mosaic every week with no compromise. So when those hard times come, you have those habits, those roots, that foundation that you're drawing life from. Some of you are going through a hard time right now, a horrific time, but because you've been practicing habits, you have a framework to get you through it. If you are not in a storm right now, prepare for the storm. Dig that foundation. See, Job isn't getting in a bad situation and trying to then figure, that out, figure out if he should follow God. That does not work as well. You can do it. It just won't be as easy. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it as wise. You're like a person who builds a house on solid rock. The rain, though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. Well, your world collapses when tragedy strikes. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Sometimes I'll hear people say, they'll point to somebody else and they'll say, I can never get through that. I can never handle what they're going through. And you're right. You couldn't handle what they're handling because you haven't been doing what they've been doing. If your faith gets shaky at every sign of stress or tragedy, that should tell you your foundation isn't strong enough. When I was in college, I worked on the landscaping and maintenance crew. Most of the time we just used weed eaters, took care of the landscaping, that type of thing. But one day I showed up for work, and we went into this old house on campus, kind of like a small mansion, I guess. And, and we just started taking anything out of it that could be salvaged. We took doorknobs and a bathtub and chandeliers. And finally I asked my boss, why are we taking all this stuff out of this house? And he said, it's getting bulldozed next week. I said, why is it getting bulldozed? This is a beautiful house. This is an old house. This is gorgeous. He said, I know, it's a big shame. He said, the foundation is so damaged, it's beyond repair, it's unsafe for anybody to live here. Listen, if you find out your spouse has been lying to you, or the employee embezzled the money and it's gone, or your parents' marriage is over, they threw in the towel, or the sickness is never going away, if the foundation is cracked, nobody cares how beautiful the exterior is. Job has a naive response at first, but at least it's based on truth he can fall back on. Now, Job's next stage uh, is whining. I really debated what to call this. I, I had in my notes at first pessimism and then complaining, but really all he does for most of the book as he whines. I want to show you part of what he says. Why wasn't I born dead? What I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness, no rest. Only trouble comes. I'd rather be strangled, rather die than suffer like this. Oh God, you've ground me down and devastated my family. I was living quietly until God shattered me. He took me by the neck and broke me in pieces. I cry out, help, but no one answers me. I protest, but there's no justice. I long for the years gone by when God took care of me. I cry to you, God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. You've become cruel toward me. You use your power to persecute me. So 
Oh, he's a little unhappy. <laughs> Here's what this tells me, though. We can bring our complaints to God. We can bring our complaints to God. Yancey writes, one bold message in the book of Job is that you can say anything to God. Throw at him your grief, your anger, your doubt, your bitterness, your betrayal, your disappointment. He can absorb them all. See, Job's trying to work out what he's feeling, what he's thinking. He's searching for some way to make sense of his suffering. He's not getting very far, but he's trying. When you face suffering, please, please try to work it out. Professional counselors will tell you that in marriage counseling, the number one sign of impending divorce is despair. Despair. Where people aren't even trying to work on their relationship. They just don't care enough to try. And in marriage counseling, if there is yelling or anger or tears or deep frustrations that are being expressed, that's actually a good thing, even though it doesn't feel good at the time, because it shows the couple cares enough that they're invested. If they don't even try, they've already given up. No marriage counseling can help that. If you are honest with God about your frustration, betrayal, lack of understanding, that shows you want to fight for the relationship. In fact, I want to give you a chance to be honest with God right now. Right now, I want you to pray, and I'm going to start it for you. Here's what I want you to pray. God, the way I feel toward you right now is what? Be honest. Go ahead and do that. Some of you need to continue that conversation when you get home tonight. Be honest. Job's final stage is humility. God shows up. We talked about that last week. He kind of blasts Job and puts him in his place a little bit, and we find our true answers. We said last week in Jesus. But look at Job's response, Job 40, verse 3. Job replied to the Lord, I'm nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. I know that you can do anything, God. No one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. I had only heard about you before, but now I've seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. When Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Now look at that. It's interesting that when Job prayed for his friends, not himself, when Job prayed for his friends, that's when the Lord restored Job's fortunes. When you exist... For someone outside yourself, that's when God blesses you. Verse 12, so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Now in the beginning of the story, if you remember, Job lost 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, 500 female donkeys, and 10 children. God gives him twice what he'd had before, but he only gives him back 10 more children. Why doesn't God give Job 20 children? Because that wouldn't be a blessing. <laughs> but it's also because he didn't lose those children. They'd just gone on ahead to heaven. Verse 16, Job lived to see four generations of, of his children and grandchildren. Then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. The story of Job ends up great, but he never gets an answer. He never understands why, but he says, I'm going to place my faith in you, God. 
Yancey says there are two wagers that take place in the book of Job. First, Satan says to God, the only reason this man Job follows you is because you made his life, his life easy. You've given him everything he wants. God says, okay, do anything you want. I'll bet on Job. But then during his trials, Job chooses how to respond. And even amidst his complaining and bitterness and not knowing the answers, he says, I'm still going to bet on God. What he's doing is betting on God. First, God bet on, bet on Job, then Job bet on God. And this is an intellectual thing. Physically, he's still hurting. His, emotionally, he's still hurting. His kids are still dead. But he's saying intellectually, even though I don't feel like it, I'm placing my life, my pain, my past, my future in God's hands. And all that takes is humility. Now, there are two objections to this. One is, you may be saying, that's great that God showed up for Job, but God hasn't shown up for me. The answer to that objection is, he did show up. He died on the cross and rose from the dead. But I know for some of you don't, that won't be good enough and you'll walk away. And the reason I know that is because that's what they did in the Bible. See, in the Bible, they saw God appear in fire and smoke on Mount Sinai, but later at the foot of that same mountain, they worshiped an idol. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve worked, uh, walked with God in the cool of the day, yet they still disobeyed and ate what they weren't supposed to. God appeared to Solomon dramatically and gave him wisdom and riches beyond measure, yet Solomon still wandered away to other gods. Jesus' disciples had a front row seat for the miracles of healing the blind, curing the sick, making the lame walk, but they all ran away when it meant they may get arrested. In the Bible, when God shows up in fire and smoke and miracles, it doesn't make any difference. The only thing that made a difference is if people were humble. Now, objection number two is it got better for Job. What if it doesn't get better for me? The divorce is final. The child is dead. The disability isn't going away. The relationship is irreparably damaged. The answer is still humility. Here's what Job says amidst his suffering before he gets any blessing or gets his health back. Job 19.25, but as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand upon the earth at last. After my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. Put that last verse back up there. This is the central verse of the book of Job. He's saying, I know my Redeemer lives. I don't understand how it will work. I don't have all the answers. I haven't even heard of Jesus yet. But after my his body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. He's talking about the resurrection, the hope we have in Jesus. He's saying, even if it doesn't get better for me here, one day I will meet God face to face. I had a church planner call me recently, and he said, Carl, I'm getting ready to plant this church, and uh, you know we want it to be a church for people who don't go to church like Mosaic, but I want your advice he said, some people are telling me if you want it to be for people who don't go to church, then on your launch team, even in the initial stage, that you shouldn't have Christians. You shouldn't have people who go to church. And he said, other people are telling me if you want to have a church, you got to, based on Christians, launch team should all be Christians. What do you say? And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, you know what, Mosaic, our framework's just entirely different. For us, it's all about humility. See, if a Christian comes to Mosaic, but they're arrogant, and they want to tell us, you need to change this, or here's how you should really do it, or I don't like that, they're just not going to last here. And it's not that we don't like them. We want them to stay. You know, we want, to, we want them to encounter God and have community, but, but they just won't last because we don't cater to arrogance. And the non-Christian, when he comes, he can be arrogant or humble. And if he's arrogant, he probably won't last long either because he's just trying to cause division and ask questions not to really search, but just to cause trouble. And and we'll tr be patient as we can, but we're just not going to cater to that. But if a non-Christian comes and they're humble, we'll sit with his questions all day long. We'll listen to her doubts, and we'll be patient however long her journey takes. And so I summed it up and said, a Mosaic, for us, it's not really about are you technically a Christian or not. It's more about are you humble? 
the Bible says over and over, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Jesus humbled himself to death on a cross to give his life for you. So we're going to take communion in a moment to celebrate that. Trey's going to be passed down your row. We want you to take a stack of the two cups. There will be a cracker representing Jesus' body and some juice representing Jesus' blood. We want you to eat and drink that anytime after you get it. But in the Bible, there's a radical shift in writers' attitudes about suffering after the cross. See, when New Testament writers, when the writers after Jesus speak of hard times, they don't have the indignation that characterized Job and Jeremiah and so many of the people in the Bible who lived before Christ. The writers offer no real explanation for suffering, but they keep pointing to two events, the death and resurrection of Jesus as the final answer. Jesus was killed on a Friday, and he rose from the grave on a Sunday. Our problem is we live on Saturday. Faith means believing that Sunday's coming. Faith believes in advance what will only make sense in reverse. God asks you to have faith that he's going to set things right, that he's going to redeem your pain, that he will have the last word on your circumstances. See, I don't look at the gospel through the lens of my suffering. I look at my suffering through the lens of the gospel. And that's what happened in the life of this person who wrote me this email. He said, Carl, I've been pondering several different points of self-discovery since we've begun Battle Scars. More than any other sermon, this series has spoken to me, to the inner parts of me, and I know I'm not alone. He describes his pain, and then he describes joining the army, thinking maybe it'd just be better to die giving my life for somebody else. He says, the death I wanted never came, at least not the way I thought it could. I came home safe, but not sound. My heart was in misery. In these last few weeks, I've learned things about myself. I have no misconceptions of the evils I'm capable of, but I've also learned there was love in my heart. I discovered in my heart there was hope. Hope to love people that I come in contact with every day. And I knew these things didn't come from me. When I think of the wonderful blessings that are in my life, like my treasure of a wife, there's a passion that goes beyond definition. Love like that doesn't come natural to me. That was the healing power of Jesus in my heart. And the death I was seeking wasn't a grand sacrifice, but a daily moment to moment choice of obedience in giving myself up a bit of a time in the pursuit of Jesus. I don't have answers for tomorrow. I'm just solving the ones I've encountered today. But today... I have hope, and I have love, and that was more than I had yesterday. Humble yourself. It is okay to question God. It is okay to be mad. It is okay to curse the unfairness of life. It is not okay to be arrogant. Humble yourself before the Lord. And he will lift you up. Yancey says there are two wagers. One between God and Satan. And God said, that person. I'm giving up my son for that person. The other wager is on you. Whose side will you choose? God's or Satan's? For God or against him? Your pain, your suffering, your battle scars must remind you that you live in a sinful world, that this place is broken, that you are a sinner, and that you need saving. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Help us be humble. I think as Christians, sometimes we get too caught up in is somebody technically a Christian or not. 
And while we believe that question has eternal ramifications, we don't want to be somebody who comes to you and then is arrogant about it. God, our pain has humbled us. Our battle scars remind us of our humanity and therefore our humility. God, redeem them. Keep us humble before you, before the one who humbled himself to death on a cross. Help us live for you. Amen.